through the unleavened bread Passover uh, situations and the solemnness, the brutality, the trauma, all the emotions, all the restless nights. Keep us in mind of what's going on this morning uh, many years ago and help us to understand and, and, and just kind of really get a, gris, a grasp and just grip that sense of mindset that these women have, waking up early, so early to get out there and and what a, what a, what a <laughs> what an experience they didn't know was coming that they would experience and and later on the men were involved in seeing and knowing so Father we thank you so much for all that you have given to us validating everything you've promised everything you've said everything hanging on your validation of the resurrection that uh, confirms our faith that we can trust you in your word 100% not 90 not 99 but 100% everything you say will and has come true and will and still yet come true that which has not yet been fulfilled and the resurrection isn't just the validation of our faith but it validates that those people that say today oh that's not going to happen or you're not going to come we know just as it was the first time unlikely as it may have seemed it happened and it will happen again so we thank you for reminding us of your, your the joy the, the the promises your faithfulness your truth how it resonates and just ask us to be uh, just mindful of that just this this day keep our hearts and minds and fixed on you so we ask you to be with us all as we all reminded of the refreshment, restoration, and encouragement that you give to us this day. Uh, just be with us. Uh, may you be our pastor, our teacher, our guide, our counselor, our redeemer. Uh, you live and uh, be with us now as our coming bridegroom as well. We ask all this in Jesus, Yeshua's risen name we pray. Amen. Oh, so today uh, we're going to talk about, of course, Resurrection Sunday. So happy Resurrection Sunday on Easter. I didn't want to use the board today because it's just kind of really emotional. And don't forget, this Friday will be a memorial to the Lord from my dad for this Friday. That'll be that. But, but, but today is about the resurrection of Christ. And, and, and I just can't... <laughs> so much excitement. I just kind of go through, the, um, go, go through that, that, that mental, uh, emotional frame of these people and the spiritual context of... Uh, I just want to re- just remind us of Sunday. Was, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday was the best days of their life. The best days of their life. Not just walking with Christ, but ever. They had Palm Sunday, Hosanna. They had Monday, Olivet Discourse. Tuesday, same thing, continuing. Then it took a solemn turn on Tuesday night to a traumatic turn Wednesday. And ever since Tuesday night, where they had no sleep, coming from a high, high euphoric couple days to now this low, low, just gut punch. Imagine what those days would have been like. You couldn't sleep. Your physical body is fatigued. Your mental body, your mental frame is just churning. You can't sleep. You want to, but you can't. You're just restless. This happened Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. Unbelievable. So Saturday night was no different. And I could just see the Sabbath ending at 6 p.m. Saturday, but then they're preparing the Aramaics and to, to embalm him. Not forgetting to the Joseph Arimathea and Nicodemus and the women earlier had already embalmed him. And it formed like a plaster of Paris from the neck down. And they, and they wrapped his head in a cloth. And they're just there to go to, to, to give their respects. And, and, and that's what they thought they were going to do. And, and I can imagine, just remember your, your mindset when you go to give your respects to when someone says the funeral for your loved one is such and so time and the, and the graveside service is such and such time. You don't go there with joy to celebrate. You don't go there with, with party favors and balloons. You go there with a some solemn mindset of reflection, of memories. You have some joy. You have some pains. But let's face it, we're all solemn. We're sober-minded. That's what they were like, sober-minded, solemn, but yet still a little bit anxious to ensure the fact that they could, they could embalm him to make sure he didn't have any disrespect to their customs and making sure they tend for him, assuming he was still dead. <laughs> what a surprise they were in store for. So they, 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 they have the charge led by Mary Magdalene, and I just can't say enough about her because remember who she was. I want to get the players first so you know who these people are, these women because it's interesting, because we get involved in the story, we forget who these women are. Let's remember these women, who, who they were in their journey. Mary Magdalene, seven demons in her, expelled by Jesus, Yeshua. Be gone! No wonder she followed him all the days of her life. No wonder they assume and lie about her having some adulterous thing with Jesus. No, she loved him as her Savior. She didn't want to ever leave his side. You wouldn't either if seven demons who had tormented you were expelled from you. You too would, not, would just want to hang around him with your every breath. His every breath of what he says and what he does is you're just hanging on every single, every single thing. She was right there. Then you have Joanna, by the way, which is Mary Magdalene's friend. You can read about that in Luke chapter 8. She was her friend. She was right there in the same place when that happened. She, she was there. She became friends with her. So Joanna is that person. Another one of the women that was there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, of course. Right? Mary had a sister named Mary. 
So imagine Mary Magdalene thinking back to th- this person that she loved and endeared to. Think of Joanna, her friend, who was in- insightfully understanding, understanding of that, that, that depth of care and concern, always being there for her friend, Mary Magdalene, but Mary Magdalene was just so in love what Christ had done for her. Then you had Mary the mother, obviously, a mother's endearing love and heartbreak, what she saw and witnessed. Of course she was going to be there. Then Mary's sister supporting her. Her, si- her name was Mary as well. So there's three Marys. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary's sister Mary. Then there's another Mary, the Mary the mother of James. They, they, they say she's James the, the lesser or James of Alphia. She, she was that mother as well. So there's now four Marys. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, Mary's, mo- Mary's sister, Mary, and then Mary, the mother of James, of, of, of Alphaeus, or the younger. Now, remember, why would they point her out of all the other apostles? Because, remember, James of Alphaeus was known to be a, a similitude of the face and visage of Jesus, and he always was a humble man, putting his hair on his face. You can kind of understand, maybe she identified with how he must have felt the garden that day when he was not wanting to be mistaken for Jesus, hence the reason why Judas, being at night, kissed him on the cheek to ensure this is the one. So it's just an amazing thing that she's mentioned. And then you also have Salome, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. She was there as well. So you have Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary's sister Mary, Joanna, and Mary Magdalene's friend. So each Mary, Mary Magdalene, and the two big chief Marys, Mary Magdalene and Mary's mother, each had a support with them. Mary's sister Mary, and then Mary Magdalene's friend Joanna. Then you had Salome, who was there as well, right? Salome was there, the mother of James and John, and then also the other Mary, which is the mother of James of Alphaeus, the lesser. And there's your six women there. Unbelievable scene of these women. But as they were meeting and, and, and a group to go there, and as Mary Magdalene led the charge, and she was saying to them, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, she was the one. She was the one who wanted to do that. She was the one who couldn't wait to look forward to giving respects to her Lord albeit she didn't know he risen from the dead, she was that respectful. She was that solemn sense of, we've got to be there first and bright and early. So she wants to get there early as all get out. She says, really, is why the scriptures kind of unfold to you what happens. So they go as a group, but they're set off in pairs. And these pairings are obviously the first two is Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus. They're definitely tied in there. Then you have, of course, the two support staff of Mary, which is Mary's sister Mary and Joanna and Mary Magdalene's support. They were there. I think they were paired off along with then the last two would be Salome as well with, with the other Mary again. Uh, so the mother of James the Younger. So it's just an amazing, the two mothers of the apostles. So you have this really interesting thing of the two sets, the three sets of two, Mary Magdalene and Mary's mother, Mary's sister Mary, and then Joanna are the two support staff of Mary Magdalene and, and Mother Mary. And then you have the two other last ones, and, and Salome, and, and again, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, the two mothers of the apostles. So I think it's just an interesting passage. When you think about this, after they said they're coming to the tomb, they're coming as one group, but they're different kind of set in pairings, distance apart from each other. And, and it's an amazing thing, as you see, and Matthew says it in chapter 28, verse 1. I, I, just, <laughs> I just can't imagine. I'm talking about excitement now, but it wasn't that way when this day dawned many years ago. When this day was dawning many years ago, it was early morning around 3 a.m., Mary's there, and it says, After now, the Sabbath, that's plural. This is Matthew 28, verse 1. Sabbath, W-V, Sabbaton, it's plural. Keep in mind, the word Sabbath is used for, it says, the Mia of the Sabbaths, plural, because remember, there's always, Sab- every week's a Sabbath week because there's a Sabbath at the end of every week. You rest on the seventh day. So when he says the Sabbaths of the Sabbath week, so he's talking about the Sabbaths, so there was a Sabbath day rest, Passover, unleavened bread, and the regular Sabbath. That's what he's talking about in verse 1 of Matthew 28. The Sabbath day rests. And you go into, it was a holy convocation, a day of rest for God, these, these feast days. And then it says, into the first of the week, or the first of the Mia of the Sabbath tones. So it's telling you it's Sunday. So she's there on Sunday. It's after 6 p.m. Saturday. She got the Aramaics together. She got the other ladies together because now they could converse and do some work after the Sabbath rite can be completed. Let's, let's go in and let's, let's pay him respects. Not knowing he had risen from the dead at midnight. Why midnight? Because he fulfilled the Paschal Lamb to its tea in Exodus when Moses was told to get the spotless and blameless Lamb, one you've raised up for a year, you've known personally and intimately and emotionally, and kill that Lamb, spotless and blameless. And I want you to put the blood on the doors and lentils and, I've, and the father of that house, all that's in, 
Because if he does that, all had been then have Passover passage from death to life. And the angel of death did this passage from looking at the doors at midnight, the passage from death to life. He passed over. That's how you know Christ, the fulfillment to the T of the Paschal Lamb sacrifice. He passed from death to life and gave us that death to life passage at midnight on Saturday, which constitutes Sunday to a Jewish mind and a Gentile mind, both. So here in Matthew 28, verse 1, after the Sabbath, as it was dawning to the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala and the other Mary, this is clearly to be known, the Mary, the mother of Jesus. Look what it says. They went, they went to see the tomb. The word for see is throw aside. Throw aside is the word for gaze or to, or, or to ponder. It's almost like I say to you, let's go to the art museum to, look at the, to, to, to take a look at, at what's there. We don't mean just look and walk right by. No, when you look at an art museum, when you look at a piece of art, you look at a piece of, of sculpting, of, of time spent, of God's creation, of God's beauty, you sit and you ponder and you meditate. So they weren't going to the tomb just to, just to be there and check a box and leave. Notice their heart intent. Their heart intent was to go there to ruminate. Their heart was to go there to meditate, to pay respects. It reminds me of the Moses burning bush because he had to stay, sit there, stand there and look and see for about five minutes. Those brambles took about that long to, to know if they were on fire. That's how much it takes for them to be consumed. And Moses made the statement, it was on fire, but it wasn't consumed. But the principle was he was then still just staring, meditating, ruminating. And then he knew who God was. That's why the scripture in Psalm 46, when it says, be still and know that I am God, should be rendered as until you are still, you will never know that I am God. Mary Magdalene and Mary's mother went there to be still, to be meditating, to ruminate, to, to pay respects. So their mindset was in the right place. Their heart was in the right place. Their spiritual framework was in the right place. You see some consistencies there of people saying, I don't know why I'm not blessed by saying deeper things in God's word. I don't know why I'm not blessed by having God in my life. Be still. Have the right mindset. Have your heart in the right place. Have your spirit demeanor in the right context. Block out all the outside noise. Imagine what was going on in town. The hate and the malice that had generated from three days prior. The, dis the, the, the depression and sadness they were engulfed in. They put it all to the side just to meditate and ruminate over him. That was their intent. Understand this. When it says see the tomb, it means that thurazai, they were there to stare and look and just kind of take it in, absorb it. Like you would at an art museum. You're absorbing the, the detailed nuances of everything you were to remember that you saw and heard. Not just on that day, that fatal day, Wednesday, a few days ago, but all his three years of ministry, all the warm, loving touches, all the compassionate, loving teaching, all of that. The joy on his face, the intimation of hearing your name be called by him, all these things. So in verse 2, And behold, a great shaking occurred for an angel of the Lord. A great shaking of the Lord. A great shaking occurred. An angel of the Lord has descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. So in the book of Matthew, he talks about one angel rolling back the stone and he sat on it. We're going to find out in, in, in Matthew and in Mark, you're going to see him talk about doors of the tomb. It's plural. You go, what? That's not really what I remember hearing. Hey, I, don't, I didn't write the book. But it's in the plural. Look at it in your scripture. We'll see it coming up here. Right here in verse 3, left side of your margin, you'll see it in brackets. And then from the heavens approaching, rolled away the stone from the doors, the thuros. It's in A-S. That's a plural rendering suffix. Why is it plural? Because, my friends, my brothers and sisters, there was a tomb, a huge monstrosity of a, of a stone that you could not lift on your own unless you're Samson. <laughs> you know, unless you're God himself, but as a man, there's no way. You need to have the strength of Samson to do something like that, and those guys aren't around anymore. That was a one-off back in the Old Testament. So you need men, plural, to get this bad boy to be moved. And it was just rolled away by an angel like it's no big deal, like it's a piece of cotton ball, moved away. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And not to mention, so inside, the, the, that covers the entrance of the tomb, that inside the tomb is a smaller little stone that would, that would guard, there was a walking area where you would sit. There's another area where you actually laid the body, the actual sarcophagus itself. We actually would go in. So there's two doors. There's a door, you, the main door you walk in, you could sit. And then there's also, as you walk in further, there's the tomb, there's the inside of where they would lay his body. And there was a smaller stone that, yeah, one person strong enough could possibly roll away, or at least two people could. So when it says doors, I mean this, the outer and inner chamber. Kind of interesting, isn't it? That God veils from those people's mindsets this duality of his kingdom to come has a heavenly and an earthly sphere, one within the other, a sporo seed 
from within it a sperma seed. Just like people are veiled to that truth, they're veiled to the reality that Scripture says, doors of the tomb. I didn't write the book. That's what it says. It's plural. Then you look into verse chapter 2 when the angel sat on this, this stone and came down from heaven. The singular angel, the singular angel comes down. And Jesus says ascensions, and, and, and there was two angels, two men that came up, came up, appeared by them. It's an amazing thing. But the story of his resurrection has one angel, then a young man, and then two men, and then two angels. That's the unfolding of what we see in the resurrection of Christ from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One angel in Matthew, a young man in Mark, two men in Luke, and also then we have two angels in John. And they do different things, and they're described a little bit differently, little nuances here and there. Let's look back again and remember this, and let's get into this understanding of we saw the women who were involved. Let's see what they experienced again, going back to verse 2 of Matthew 28. Great shaking occurred. Again, the earth is, remember, if you're feeling a great shaking, and you just got finished seeing what happened on Wednesday, what's your mindset? Oh, I remember this great shaking. It's the same kind of shaking when the temple veil rent in two, when the ground shook, when he breathed out his last breath. Remember? Do you find a coincidence here of what the angel was trying to do? You know, just like when Peter was, was smelling the charcoal fire and Jesus said, do you love me? God has a way with reminding us of events that were first piercing to us were now going to be healing to us. God uses pain for healing. God uses all these things. He never wastes your pain. Never does he waste your pain. Nope. He's the redeemer of that pain. He uses it in your life. I wish I had ability to do songs and, 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 and to do videos. I want, to, I want to play the song. I know my Redeemer lives and in the background. Show me getting beat by my parents. And I would just be singing, and I know my Redeemer lives. And I would just show myself getting beat and how he loved me through that. How he loved me by that. How he loved me in that. Because that's the truth of it. You don't want to think about that, but hello, the crucifixion was that. Wake up, people. That's what it was. That was God's love. You know, it didn't look like love. I know. That was God's point of it all. They didn't understand that either. And they're there going, all I can think about right now is just the, the honoring respects and ruminating on our, on our Savior and our, and our Master who's no longer here. They were about to find out that God's love is defined by more than just what you feel, more than what you experience. It's defined by the truth of God's Word and His never-altering, unchangeable promises of His presence never leaving you, never forsaking you, always being there. How can you be lonely when you're not alone? They thought they were left all alone. Jesus told them, I leave you not orphaned. I leave you not orphaned. He said that to them before he died in John 16. So we go back to this in Matthew 28 and verse 3. They're seeing the ground shake, hearing the ground shake. It reminds them of the ground shaking as crucifixion at the last end of when everything came to a close. How does that not correlate just a few days later? They see an angel sitting on the stone as if, oh, this is crazy. Then in verse 3 of Matthew 28, and his appearance that means his outward show. That means his countenance. So that means it's kind of an interesting, the appearance, it doesn't capture it. It means emanating from him. He was emanating from him, was, was like a lightning, and his vestments were, again, white as snow. And this vestment is his outer garment. So in other words, imagining, you ever, you ever been to the beach and, and, you, and, and someone goes, when you were a kid, look at the sun. I've done that as a kid. Bad idea. Not good. Not good for your retina, corny, and all that stuff, right? But you do it as a kid because you're dumb. You don't think. You don't know. So you look up. But there's also those times when you're not looking up at the sun, and you see somebody maybe with, uh, with something shiny on, and the sun catches it, and it blinds you, and you have to go like this, driving down the road. Sometimes in the, in the summer times, the windshield gets the sun, or it fracks in your eyes, and you've got to go like this. We all have sunglasses for a reason. We all have sun visors for a reason, right? We have hats, visors in a car, sunglasses. All of us know what it's like to have to shield our eyes from something emanating from the sun that blinds us. This is what was happening to these women. This angel was so bright emanating out this light, they had to kind of like go like this, like, okay, <laughs> I can't really look at you because it's emanating out. They weren't like having this casual conversation. It was an earth, the ground shook. He, the, the stone was rolled away. He sat on the stone, and now this light's flashing out from him, and they're just like going, okay, something is supernatural definitively going on here, right? There's no doubt about it. It's just an amazing thing. And four, verse 4, I love this part, and the fear of him, the guards trembled. And it's those keepers, those that were given guard. Remember the, the whole garrison? The whole garrison of, of guards, like 100 people, you know? They were just there to guard the tomb, and they all just fall asleep. And they come back later on and, and make up the lie. Oh, the apostles stole them. Really, 
How do they, they roll away a stone? How, how, how? How do you do that? How do they roll away a stone? How? And where were you at? You're soldiers. You, you all, all of you fell asleep. All of you at the same exact time. And you all were in a comatose, REM deep sleep. Get out of here. It sounds hard to believe, doesn't it? But they sold it with the bill of goods. Jewish idea about the Sanhedrin telling them that to say that. And they pass it on to this day. It says in scripture. That's later on. But they became as dead men. That's what really happened. Because who wants to admit as a man, as a testosterone trained soldier, I was so afraid I fainted. That sounds like a girly man thing, doesn't it? Well, too bad, Jack. No, I don't care how strong you are. If God himself or God's presence of one of God's creations, in this case an angel, comes in this state, ground shakes, stone rolls away, sits on the stone, white light emanates out of him. No wonder they went, oh, and they fainted. Which means to tell you, why didn't the women faint? Why didn't they have fear? You ever think about that? Why? It tells you why. It's the same way when Scripture says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. When you fear God the right way, God gives you that moment to take in and ruminate and meditate over what He's doing. You don't understand it, but He gives you the ability. He imputes to you the ability to hear and see what He is giving as truth to you. While others are laid dead from just the overwhelm, just like it is today. People hear God's Word being taught, they get so overwhelmed, they just get over, they, ah, ah, ah! They, they just get freaked out by it. You know what? You're just like the guards at the tomb, my friend. But that's not what God would expect of someone whose heart's in the right place, whose mindset's in the right place, and spirit's in the right place to do what? To meditate, to see the tomb, to thorough side, to ongoingly stare, meditate, take in, absorb God and His Word. If that's where you're at, then there's nothing of God's fear that would cause you to stop listening and stop looking and understanding what He's trying to say to you. That's exactly what Mary Magdalene and Mary were in that state of mind. They were being blessed because of God's disposition infused, infused into them. So the verse 5, the angel then answered and said, Women, be not you afraid, for I know you seek, which is the ongoingly inquire. It's like you were here to, we know why you're here. You're here to give respect to the dead. To that Jesus who was crucified. And by the way, the word crucified, it's a word that they made up. They didn't know what to, what to say, how to express the, the, the utter suffering and anguish that a person goes through. So the word crucify actually means to a, a word that puts together that suffering and trauma and that pain that's encompassed. There was no word to describe what the Romans did when they mailed somebody to a cross, to a pole that he carried that then was hooked on another pole poof, that formed a cross. Which is why in the scriptures it says he was staked in the exegesis Bible because it means the pole in the ground was just a pole. And that's why some people think he was, he, was, he was crucified like this. No, he wasn't. He was on a beam. And that beam was affixed to another beam, kunk, which formed a cross. And they used this word crucifixion to, 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 to imagining the suffering, the pain, the trauma that's all encompassed. There's no word for that. And that was the word got brought up because of what the Romans did. This is, the, this is the word they made up to describe what the Romans were doing to bring to death to people this particular way of killing folks, bringing out justice, so they said. Yes? Yep, it talks about and it, it talks about in the book of Luke. Only in Luke does he mention that it's such a stressful, harsh time in Luke 21 for people in the last bit of tribulation. Jesus said that the times before and since, nothing has been like this and never will be like this in the days of man. It'll be so tense, so stressful, so traumatic, so collateral damage. Because no, no joke, six billion people will be dead. Six billion with a B out of eight billion dead. And those who are alive, there's a whole chunk of them following after Satan. And there's a few vestiges left. And no wonder they're going, ha! Ah! And they're dropping like flies. Not because of they, well, not because of what they saw. Satan is now incarnate as the beast who's worshiping, is demanding worship. Demons are running around, guarding all food and water supply. Your loved ones are dropping like flies. No, there's no more light. It's all dust to dark. That's all it is. Days are not 24 hours or 16 hours. It's not a fun time. So tribulation is about that same similitude of what you just mentioned to me, how the Sumerian people, they're not concerned with that. But they're the only ones who don't have that overcome them. Everybody else either aligns with Satan 
or it overcomes them or they're struggling with that process. Those are the three outcomes. You align with him as his, as his follower, evildoer. You, you, you basically are str- dropping dead Fred because you're overwhelmed by it. You're, you're, you're one of his followers. You're overwhelmed by it. Or you're struggling to figure out how do I get through this. But one thing is for, for sure. People will be overwhelmed and just die of the stress and anxiety of that environment. But it's interesting, isn't it, to your point, how these guards have the similitude of that, that huh, overwhelmed by what this all means. And by the way, you don't think they knew that if they don't watch over this tomb, that's their life. That's how Roman rule was. If you're guarded over a prisoner, even if the person's dead in this case, why were they even there? Because the Jewish Sanhedrin knew what Jesus said, destroy this temple, I'll build it in three days. They act like they didn't know what he meant before this false mock, mock trial. Coincidentally, after he dies, they all of a sudden go to Herod, hey, or Pontius Pilate, hey, you got to go guard the tomb. They tell Pilate that. He's like, wait a minute, I thought you, thought he wasn't anybody to you. I thought you were happy he's dead. Why, why the concern? Because they knew who he was. And they knew there was the risk that what he said could be true. They didn't want to take that chance. You know, people call themselves agnostic, but there's no agnostics or atheists in the foxhole, is there? But people who say, I don't believe in no God. I used to believe in Jesus, but I walked away from him. And all of a sudden, everything goes south in their life, and they start praying. Oh, well, that's coincidental, right? That's what that's a picture of. Yes. That's right. And then that's why they had to tell the lie. We fell asleep, you know. Okay, that's still not good. That's still a measure of death. So it's kind of interesting. The Jewish angel told him the bill of goods. The angel told him, tell this to Pilate. To let you, we'll, we'll try to convince him to let you off the hook. I wouldn't even have done that. That's crazy. Either way, they lose. Why not try what they're saying? Why not try this lie? Either way, they're, they're dead meat because the tomb is empty, right? Yes. No doubt, right? So he says, why do you see Jesus? I know you see Jesus who was crucified in verse 5. Verse 6, he is not here, for he has been raised, even as he said, come see the place where he lay. So what the, what the angel is saying to them is, he, the, he was laid down in repose, as in a horizontal position. The word raised is egerthe. He was egeroed up, egerthe. He was raised from horizontal to vertical, from horizontal to vertical. He was no longer like this, he's like this, okay? He's upright. Hello, he's upright. Not the word anesthemi, he's standing. Nope, that wasn't the point here. The point was, I just want to make a point to you, he's no longer in repose. He's no longer in a state of a horizontal sleeping as if dead. Because he's not. Understand the difference between a gyro or a girthe and anesthemi or anastasis or an- anastasis. These are words that, that are different nuances. A girthe or, it comes from a gyro, which means, again, horizontal to being raised. Anastas or anesthemi means to again not just be like this, but to actually stand and be affixed to stand. And then uh, an, anesthemi and anastasis, resurrection, is a whole different rewarding that means not just be raised again to stand, but to stand affixed with a sense of approval with, you know, God's pleasingness with your life. There's, two, there's three different things. So one just gets raised, has no right to stand. One stands, and then one continually stands. There's a difference. Egero, raised, horizontal to vertical. Anastemi, raised to stand. Anastasis, raised to stand ongoing. There is a difference. With the approval of God, that is. There's a difference. So in this case, all they want to point out to the, to the, to the women, the angel wants to point out is, he's not any longer in repose. We'll get into the other stuff later, but for right now, all you need to know is, he is not reposed. He is not lying down. He is not there. Come! See where he lay. See where he was lying down when you laid him. See where he's not there anymore. So they came in the tomb. Unbelievable. And immediately in verse 7, and immediately go and tell his disciples that he has been raised. There he goes again. He's been raised from the dead ones. The Tolton Necron. He's been raised. And behold, he precedes you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Now, remind you of this. Don't forget Jesus has four ascensions. Because we'll talk about that. He ascended in John first from the garden. He ascends secondly on the road to Emmaus. Then he ascends a third time in the book of Mark when they do see him in Galilee. Then he ascends a fourth time in the book of Acts at Pentecost. He has four ascensions. I didn't make that up. I didn't write the book. No one talks about it. 
That's because they don't want to acknowledge or pay attention to these details. That's what Jesus did. He ascended four times from four different places. For those who go, no, he didn't. He didn't once. No, my friend. Four times. Four. This is coincidentally the number for his kingdom. What a coincidence. Coincidentally, the number of bodies you can have, glorified, spiritual, stoical, or natural. What a coincidence. So as you look at this scripture in Matthew 28, verse 4, and coming out, not to mention also the ascension is being caught up. There's actually four ways of a rapture. Oh, oh what a coincidence again, right, right? What a coincidence. Yeah, right. So in verse 8 of Matthew, 20, Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 8, and coming out immediately, immediately, quickly, from the tomb, see where it says, the reason why there's the in front of the tomb, that's why there's a the in front of it. Because there's an article emphasizes it isn't just the inner tomb that's coming out from where he lay his body, it's the whole tomb entirely. The first entrance way and the way they lay his body. They came out of the whole thing altogether. They're out of the tomb. They're out of the whole thing. They're out of it. And it says they come out of the tomb with fear. Look at the word for the side of your margin in verse 8 of Matthew 28. With fear, but the joy is in plural. They had fear, but they had ongoing great joy. So I want you to imagine what that's like. How do you have a fear in that moment but then have an ongoing joy that also accompanies that fear. Think about how that would, how would that grasp you? Imagine you having that. How, how, what does that look like? What does that, what does that resonate like in your mental frame and your emotion and spiritual state of mind? How do you have a fear that's a, at a moment of what you just experienced, but then that generates in you an ongoing joy? Ongoing. And now you're going to see why the men later on would say, you, 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 it's like idle talk. It's like, it's, like, it's like silly folly, what you're saying. It's like, like, like riddles. Like you're just, why? Because they were hysterically, unbelievably, it, Scripture says they were perplexed. They were astounded. They were amazed. They were in awe. No joke. They witnessed a horrific murder. And then they came to give respects, and now you're telling him he's alive? And they see the way they lay him, and he's not there? And they just start like, oh my gosh, okay, okay, so okay, okay, okay. Okay, so we went there, and then, no, 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 and then they start telling the story, and then the disciples are like, hey, you're sounding like you're hysterical. You sound delirious. And by the way, to the disciples' defense, we have all been through an emotional, mental journey that's physically taxing and spiritually draining. We get it. We're all in this together. But you sound like you've given, you've given into the hysteria of it all. You've given into the depression of it all. To their defense, that is a natural thing to think, that you just, you just, you just, you just went crazy a little bit because you're just so emotionally distraught because that's how they all were acting prior to they were all taken aback by what happened no one was like oh yeah we get it no 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 nobody was like i'm okay with this no one was okay with it no one understood what was going on they were all together experiencing this in that same way different magnitudes of mental emotional physical spiritual draining on their soul mind body spirit it was, it was harsh Verse 8, again, coming out from the tomb immediately from the tomb with fear and joy, with ongoing joy. They ran. They ran. That word for ran means they didn't just walk briskly. It's the same word they use for an athlete when he runs. That means a woman who's dressed like they're dressed, not in, not in Speedos or in tight-knit you know, Usain Bolt Olympic pants. They were in, a, they were in these long, long robes and garments, and they're running. Yeah, how hard is it to do that when you're in a, when you're in a heavy garment that's not, it's not meant to flow like that? And you're carrying air mags, you just must have dropped those. You don't get those anymore. They started running back to the disciples. They were excited, no doubt, right? Excited. There's no doubt. You don't have fear and ongoing joy and then go back running if you're not excited, if you're not so, <laughs> just so in enthused with having to share what just happened to you. To tell his disciples, it says. And the word for tell is in the ongoing sense that they were just, that's what the word, that's what they said they were just saying. They were rambling. Because you get, I mean, I, I'm, you can get, when you're so excited, you're so overwhelmed, you're so much, the, the journey you've been through of the emotional, mental, physical taxing, the spiritual trauma, you've been, all this stuff, now you come to his head of this experience, I'm not going to shut up about what I just experienced. I am overwhelmed with joy. I am, I am, I, I, I'm astounded by what I just saw. It kind of made me a little bit fearful because these soldiers, these, these, these strong men just all dropped dead. It's unbelievable, as if they dropped dead, but they fall asleep. And the angels, the, it's unbelievable. The shaking of the ground reminded me of what happened to the crucifixion. All this stuff. Angels shining light. It's unbelievable. And to say and to see what they, what they, he wasn't there, it's just overwhelming. So in verse 8, when they ran and tell the disciples they're ongoing, they're just, just saying all they saw, all they heard. Verse 9, Matthew 28. And behold, Jesus, Yeshua, met them, saying. Now, wait, wait, wait. 
I want you to understand this. The word met, it means to, it means to lean forward. So in other words, when they, they went out of the tomb, they, they, they saw him, and he just, they just didn't bump into him. No, he, he, they ran out, and he leaned forward like, well, hello there. What? <laughs> like that? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine this? They're running out to tell the disciples. And then they, 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 they run into him, and, and he, when, he, when he interacts with them, the idea of the Greek language is he leans into them. Like he leans forward as if to go, hello, what? <laughs> That's crazy. That's insane. That's insane. Like, who, what are you going to say to that? I, I thought you were dead, and now I just found out you were alive, and now you're like saying hello as if to say, you know, that's what the wording is. Like, Rejoice, greetings. It's like a, it's just an amazing thing. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's not easy, to, not easy to run in those things. So here he goes, says, rejoice. He leans in and says, rejoice, like a salutation. Rejoice. Yeah, no joke. No kidding. No kidding. Karate, rejoice. And he says, it, it, and, it, and it says they met him face to face. It doesn't mean, it, it, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't he, they weren't running past him. And he goes, hey, no, 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 no. They were running, then what the, the imagery here is, they're running right at him. Right at him. And he leans forward and says, hello. They're just to stop them in their tracks. That's the imagery here. They're running. And then right in front of them, he just, boom. He goes, hello. They're like, did you, what? That's what happened. And right here, they, they, he, they, they immediately approach him. They, they just stop in their tracks. And then they just bow down immediately. And it says, they, it says in, ver, in verse 9 of Matthew 28, and they having approached, clasped his feet and prostrated to him. They immediately grabbed hold of his feet in a worship position. They just fell down immediately. They, just, they stopped and just fell. As he reaches out, they just fell forward, grabs his, grabs his feet, and wouldn't let him go. Like, they just grabbed hold of him, man, of his garment. Just grabbed hold of his garment, they let him go. It's unbelievable. And the word there, when it says that they, they, they laid hold of him, it's the word that they use when, they, when you arrest somebody. You put hands on somebody. You lay hands on them. He was laying, they were laying hands, they laid their hands on his feet at this point. They're telling you what they, where they were at, their position of prostrating at his feet. And they grabbed him at his feet. They're grabbing his ankles and his, and his feet. Just imagine that. Just imagine that. Oh my gosh. It's just an amazing sight. To just to, oh. Then in verse 10, Jesus, Yeshua said to them, Be not afraid. Go inform or go tell my brethren so that they may go to Galilee and there they will see me. Oh, man. Look what he says about the brethren. Go and form tois adelois, those brethren. In other words, he's not specifically talking about all of Israel. He's not talking about those who followed along the way and got believing like Zacchaeus and other folks. Nope. He's specifically talking about those tois adelfois. He is specifically talking about the 11 disciples. That's right, 11. Not 12. Judas is dead. He took his life, unfortunately. And by the way, Scripture's not ignorant it says every time 11 11 11 disciples were told not 12 11 and paul wasn't even around yet that means minus judas so it's take easy, easy math right 12 minus 1 is 11 so here they go and they, and they and it says in verse 11 of matthew 28 and as they were going away some of the guard entering the city told the high priest all the things that had happened and being assembled with the elders and taking counsel they gave a good many shekels to the soldiers, saying, Say that this disciples came by night and stole him while we slept. And if this should be ported it, but to the governor, what we'll, we'll persuade him to make you safe? Either way, they're dead meat. Either way, their job has been abdicated because their gar the charge of guarding the tomb has been broken. The tomb is open and the body's missing. So why not go with the, what they're saying? If you're wondering, why would they go by this ridiculous thing? How are they going to believe this? Because the thing is, either way, they die. Because the tomb's been, been breached and the, and the body's gone. Either way, they're dead meat. So why not try this rhetoric of the Sanhedrin to see if they can persuade Pilate to be easy on him? Why not try it? Either way, you're dead. So that's what they're doing. That's why they're doing that, right? People want to ask that question. Why would they fall for such an idiotic storyline? Who's going to believe that? Because it's the only shot they got to stay alive. Either way, they're going to get killed, right? If, if you say you fell asleep, you're still abdicating your, your position. That's, 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 a, that's a death sentence. The fact that the tomb's been breached, the body's missing, death sentence. Either way, you're a dead man. Why not try to see if they can persuade Pilate, right? So in verse 15, and they having received shekels, did as they were instructed, and as 
saying is correct, currently deported among the Jews to this day. Verse 16, Matthew 28. And the 11 disciples, those 11, it says oi and 11, that means those 11 specifically, as in the 12 apostles minus Judas, went to Galilee in the mountain where Jesus had ordered them, and seeing him, they indeed prostrated, look at this now, but some doubted. Now I want you to remember, for a forward in time, let's go forward. This, when he appeared to Galilee to them, that's after Thomas saw him. This is way long in the future after they all saw him in the, up, in the room when he came into the room, said, peace be with you. So I want you to take that in for a second. People miss this timeline. This is weeks later. Matthew's just fast forwarding just to bring up to you the point that even though he rose from the dead and even though they saw him, even though they conversed with him, even though, they, even though Thomas touched him, they still doubted, which means the deeper things of God's truth, when things hit you heavy from not understanding what things are and not hearing things like no one's ever said before, of course there's going to be an adjustment period to your brain cells, to your spiritual acumen. Yes, even the apostles who believed at first still had a lingering sense of doubt. Even weeks later, when he appears to them again. Please understand this. You're not alone when you're starting to learn deeper things of God and His Word, and you go, okay, I got it. Then later on, you start to doubt it. You're not abnormal. That's normal. They did it. <laughs> but, but, but keep on the journey, and God will bless you for it, because God will keep you aware and inciting, insightful to showing the discernment and wisdom of Him and His Word being revealed to you, as He did with them. Jesus said, read the rest of the chapter 28 of Matthew, verse 18, 19, and 20. Jesus approaching spoke to them in Galilee, just weeks later, all authority has been imparted to me in heaven and on earth. Go disciple all the Goyims, all the different ethnicities, no longer Jewish. This is not the Great Commission. It's the great commandment of responsibility. Not the commandment, but the great responsibility charge. It's the great charge, not the Great Commission. It's a great charge of responsibility. He's basically, he basically says, Now go and disciple all nations, immersing them, and baptizing them to the name singular, of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. You see, triune God. The singular, names in the singular, the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Triune God. One God, three names. He said, teaching them, that means equipping them, making disciples of them. He says in verse 19, make disciples of them. That means those who already believe, as Paul would say, let's derizo them, establish them, ground them, help them understand why they should believe how they should understand just like you who saw me weeks ago and talked to me and thomas put his hands in my my hands in my side even you now weeks later are still doubting how do you think they feel you need to disciple them you need to make sure they're ster sterizos established confirmed really firm in their understanding because not everybody just because they believe in me is okay no 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 that's important but they need to understand the truth of it. Be reminded of the veracity of the depth of what this means. All the fulfillment of the Old Testament. All that's coming in the future is just as true as this you didn't think would happen. And it did. So will the future things. They need to be reminded of these things. There's just more than they understood. You for three years heard me teaching, but you didn't get it. But just like them, I'm going to hear you teaching. I'm not going to get it. You need to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. You need to help them and encourage them. And that's what this is about. It has nothing to do with... Share Jesus. No. Share the depth of the word of God and the teaching of Jesus with these people who already know and believe in the resurrected Lord. Just like you do, apostles, because you too need to ongoingly build on your faith because you saw me and yet weeks later still doubted what happened. What say you? Make disciples, in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have enjoined upon you. And behold, I am with you all the days till the end, or the ends, this is the plural, of the age. Because there's ends <laughs> of the age. Speaking of us as well, the end of this time when you leave in tribulation, that leads into the real end of the age, because there's a transition of seven years before this age ends. Yikes. It's, it's bad. It's a, right? That's why it says age. The ends is plural, because there's two ends. There's an end of his reign over us and helpful to us and then all of a sudden tribulation starts a whole different shift of satan taking over it's a little different right so and you look at they'll go now go to mark 16 go back to the resurrection story as you read each, each gospel mark 16 verse 1 and that sabbath very being passed 
and they're stopped being passed. Mary of Magdala, and that Mary, the mother of James. Here you have, again, the fir- and, and, and Matthew, there's Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Here you have Mary Magdala, Mary, the mother of James, the lesser, the apostle, and Salome, mother of James and John. That's who's being mentioned here in Mark. Yes? No, so again, so when he, when he says make disciples, make disciples is making disciples of people who already believe. Did they know he rose from the dead? No, it's not the point. The point is, when you say he rose from the dead, don't stop there. Establish them just like you need to be established apostles. Even you who saw me raised from the dead have a hard time grasping it. How much chance do you think they have of grasping when you tell them that and they believe it? How much staying power will that have? You even start started to forget and be doubting weeks later. You who learned with me for three years, what chance do they got of believing initially and then stopping there? So when he says teaching, yes, he means educate them in the awareness, I rose from the dead. But don't stop there. Ground them. That's the point here. The point is not to say they didn't know who he was at all or, or they knew who he was. That's not the point. The point is not saying they already knew and then they're teaching them. The point is when they're making aware of who he is that he rose from the dead, they're not stopping there. They're, they're, they're teaching God's word. They're establishing them and their understanding of Christ. That's the point. So to your point, yes, some of these folks didn't know at all he rose from the dead. So yes, they are teaching he rose from the dead, but they're not stopping there. They're continuing to establish those who did believe and the understanding of what they should believe and how and what Jesus taught. That was the point. So a great point you're making. It isn't just folks who didn't just Everybody just started to believe out of nowhere. No, they had to be told first, right? There were some that heard the, the, the rumors and started to believe, but there was the reality that the most of them, to your point, did not. So they had to be told he rose from the dead, and they had to be established in what that means, reflecting back on who Jesus is, what he came to do and teach, and let's review how to establish you in that teaching and in the person and work of Christ. So great comment. So then you go back to Mark chapter 16 and verse Two, and very early of the first day of the week about sunrise, they came to the tomb. And they said to themselves, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Look at the left side of your margin in verse 3. Who will roll away for us the stone out of the doors, plural, of the tomb? It's plural. Plural. Some might say, well, Matthew, it's in brackets. Well, here it's not. So either way, I'm not concerned with brackets. So all, all that means is not in the general text of the Vatican. So what? So what? Still in the text. Just not the majority of all of them. So in verse 4, for it, was very, for it was very large, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. The word looking up means they, it means to ana blipo again. So it means, they, it means to gain sight of again, which means they were downcast. To gain sight of again the stone means one of two things happened. If something blinded them and affected their view, which could have been the angel with the vestment, remember, blinding them, or it could have been they were just in so much repose of the downcast nature of talking about it, they were like, who's going to move the stone from us? And all of a sudden they looked up, oh my gosh, it's gone. It's gone. I think it's that. But they were emotionally distraught. They were kind of hanging their heads a little bit, talking to each other, not paying attention. And when they looked up, regained uh, Anablito again, then they saw, oh, it's been moved. That's verse 4. Verse 5, And coming to the tomb, they saw a youth sitting at the right side. Now, if you go into the left side of your margin in verse 5, and entering into the tomb, not coming to, entering into. So in Matthew, they saw an angel. The ground shook. The angel rolled away the stone, sat on the stone. They saw that on the, he's on the outside of the tomb. They saw a young man inside the tomb, sitting to the right. So they walk in to the right where he was a little sitting in. They, they see you, and they go, um, that's weird, right? And he's dressed differently. He has, a, he has a stole on. The garment the angel had on was just an outward garment it's, it's described as. Whereas this man, who's this youth, he has a stole on, which is a long flowing robe all the way down covering the feet. Not to the ankle, but covering the feet. It's long and flowing all the way down. And they were struck with awe, it says. Which the word there, struck with awe, it has the ek in front of it. So not just the regular awe, 
as you'd be describing in the Greek language, but it's the ek. That means out of the situation, out of what is happening, out of their state of mind now being changed and altered, their emotions being like unbelievably off the chart. They, out of that, all of that's going on, they were even more awestruck walking in and seeing a young man st- sitting there. Like, what is this? Well, who's this young man? I actually have always taught and still believe to this day that this young man's a symbolism is a type of Abel. I think he is Abel. Because there's no other person I can think of who died at a young age who would be suitable as a type of Christ who would be present to announce the resurrection of Christ than the, the very first type of all time, the first symbol of all time of Christ, which was Abel. He was right there, killed by his brother in the field openly, and Cain, just like Christ was killed openly in the field by his brother, the Jewish people. So this Jew sitting on the right side, clothed with a white garment, they were in awestruck. In verse 6, he says to them, Be not alarmed. That means, again, same X in front of it. Out of your alarming, out of what's going on, don't be even more alarmed. In other words, the, again, the word alarmed here means that, but it means out of the state of the environment that you're already experiencing, the state of mind you're in. It's bringing up the latitude of not just the word itself to be amazed, but out of, because of what you're going through. So it's kind of like saying, you can have stress and anxiety, but if I bring up stress and anxiety out of a traumatic event, if you're having, if you're having dust and carnage of people around you, just laying waste because of just what happened and, the, and like a 9-11 for example for our people from New York so they're not just traumatized but out of what happened they're even more so traumatized right so when you use the word ek that, that, that prefix it brings up the, the environment that you're in and the mental state of what you're already enduring is the, feeds into the amazement okay that's what he's talking about so because of this says do not be alarmed he doesn't, he doesn't mean alarmed he means don't be even more so alarmed out of what you've already been experiencing and everything you're seeing and hearing. That's what he's talking about. It's feeding into that narrative that they are already been seeing and hearing things that are just blowing them away. And he's saying, don't continue out of that. Don't be alarmed. Then he says this, you seek Jesus, that Nazarene who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. See the place where they lay him. Then, then again, they see again. The, the, he's not there, right? <laughs> Linen, linen clothes, you're going to talk about it in the book of John. Linen clothes were lying there from the neck down like a hollow shell, and the napkin folded up to the side. It's unbelievable. Only John mentions that distinction, but we're going to get there. But go, say to his disciples, and to Peter, he points out in the book of Mark, and to Peter. Interesting, isn't it? And to Peter. That he precedes you to Galilee, then you will see him as he said to you. And coming out, he, he, they fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them. You see, they were perplexed, they were trembled, they were astonished, they were amazed. All these different emotions. Now you're seeing why, how this didn't, how this couldn't have uh, evaded them. It's going to affect them, how they didn't want to believe them, the apostles, because when you're filled with astonishment and amazement and trembling and fear and alarmness, how are you going to come across rationally insane? And that's why I want, I, the best I can, I'm trying to, 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 to harness this emotion that God has in me, and I'm talking about, next, you may think, well, you're talking fast. Boy, you're talking really passionate. Imagine how they were talking to the apostles back in the day when it really happened. You think I'm being stoked. They were beyond stoked. Because Scripture is telling you they were amazed, they were trembling, they were alarmed, they were perplexed. They were beyond euphoria. They were beyond joy. They, they, how could you shut up by what you just saw? So you're not going to talk slow and say, we came from the tomb. We saw an angel. That's not how you're saying it. No, you're not. You're talking very quickly, very briskly, very high tone, very excited, and to make sure your face is like lighting up, your body language is everywhere, how could you not be? And that's what they said, you sound like foolish people. That's why. Give the disciples a chance to give, give, give the disciples some latitude of why they would say that. They weren't being ugly and mean. They were just saying, look, we've all been through it. We've had our trials these last couple of days, and you sound like you've snapped. That makes sense from a human standpoint. But it's, they were wrong, right? Look in verse... Again, 8, once again, Mark 16. And then they, trembling and astonishment seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Yeah, you see? They don't want to tell anybody. Out of what they saw, they, and the only reason they're telling the disciples, because they were told to tell the disciples by the angel and now by the young man. Go tell the disciples. Verse 9 says, And having risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary. That's Protos, because he, 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 he appeared to Mary Magdalene and Mary. And then now Mark's talking about when he appeared to Mary later on. 
and the real intimate way that John records, which is just her and him talking outside the tomb. So this is what verse 9 is talking about in, John's, in Mark 16. Verse 9, he's talking about what happened later on when he appears to Mary after already appearing to Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, as Matthew records. He appeared first to Mary of Magdala, from whom he expelled seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, and they were mourning and weeping. Again, not only were they thinking they snapped, they themselves were still mourning and weeping. This goes to show you, remember, we forget, remember when, when Joseph mourned for his father for over a week, the people of Egypt mourned for two weeks after 30 days, remember that? This is Jesus, their Messiah, their Master, their friend, their Savior, their God. It's only been three days. Of course they're still mourning and grieving. Of course. And this is why they can't understand. Not only is the, is the euphoria and their intimation of their language, uh, they're talking fast, they're talking high-pitched, they're, they're excited, their faces lighten up, their body language is all over the place. Not only that, the disciples are thinking, hey, wh why are you like that? We're mourning and grieving. There's a little bit of disconnect there. This doesn't fit. You're not, what? Is, you're, what? They didn't like that. They found it disrespectful. They didn't understand how God was moving and already had moved in their life. They did come to the tomb with mourning and grief and respect. It isn't their fault God changed their life. They did not go for a healing service to go pray to the Lord. No, God had that happen to them. They did not make an appointment to go, I'm going to go, hallelujah. That's not what happened. God did it to them. Did not go seeking after this charismatic moment. This moment is spontaneously organic, generated by God himself and the event that happened. Just like in the scripture. You can't will yourself to understand God's word. You can't will yourself to have a euphoric moment with God. God makes that happen in your life. It's him. Him and his word on their own. He, the living God and his word, the living word, will in him, himself and itself bring to life in you a sense of joy spontaneous, organically, orchestrated by Him. Uh, we don't direct that. We don't control that. He does. But when it happens, it's genuinely real when you know it's of God. So here they said, we're weeping and, 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 and mourning. They couldn't understand that that happened to them, basically, because God and His Word changed their life. But, but, but they, in other words, what do we chop liver? I don't, I'm not getting this. I'm not getting the, the, the difference here. You're euphoric. Obviously, we're not. What's amiss? We endured the same things. We, we, we have the same grief. I know you care about them, so I don't get what's going on right now. Not just their actions and behaviors and their mindset and all this, but the fact that it contrasted with what they all were together just hours ago, weeping and mourning. Now there's this big division and distinction between the two of them. Interesting, isn't it? Just like somebody who says to you, I understand how you know God's word all my life. You were the same as me. You always believed like me. You always thought like me. And all of a sudden you learn about deeper things of God's word and you start telling them the real truth and they look at you like you have a third eye. If you have a horn out of your head or something. You're like, hey man, it's not my fault. I didn't go looking for this. It happened unto me. But I'm not going to reject what happened unto me being of God. And if you don't like it, that's on you. Just like the women were saying the same thing as the men. It's not my fault that you don't like it. You think we're crazy times. That's on you. It just shows where you're at. You're just upset because God didn't display that to you and you think you have this passage, this rite of passage. That's what really was going on here. They thought they had a rite of passage. How, why wouldn't they? They were the ones that were the closest to him. Why weren't they then included first? You see how God doesn't care what you think, does he? doesn't care about your logical mind. We're the studious ones. doesn't matter. Verse 11, Matthew, Mark, Mark 16, verse 11. And they, having heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, did not believe it. What? Yep, the same audacity of these apostles who after weeks later at Galilee altogether still doubted, the same audacity of these apostles who heard Mary Magdalene and doubted it, had the same audacity and kahunas to tell Thomas that he's, to this day, we still call Thomas doubting Thomas. Really? Like the rest of you weren't? Stop with the lies. All of the people of God doubted when he first rose from the dead. They didn't know what to do with this information. It's crazy time. It's news. It's like, it's not normal. As someone you, get, you love and endear yourself to, and you understand he is God and Messiah, he gets murdered in front of your eyes. And the trauma of that, you endure. Emotional high for three days, stopped by emotional low for three days, now you're in euphoria. That's, that, 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 that's a gamut of a week of emotions, man. It's unbelievable. It's hard to grasp all that. So yeah, you're going to have some doubts. I get it, but it's your normal. Not one person's isolated. We're all enduring these different things, different aspects of it. 
Verse 12 of Mark 16. And after these things, he appeared in another aspect to the two of them as they were walking, going into the country. That's the road to Emmaus. We're going to get to that in Luke coming up. Verse 13. And they returned, announced it to the other disciples. Neither to, neither to them did they give credit. I mean, neither to them, out of their story, the word X in front of it again, it's, neither to them did they believe what they were saying. So you see, they didn't believe the women. They didn't believe the road to Emmaus people. Either way, they had two testimonies. What, is, what did God tell you on the day of Moses? Uh, two, two witnesses or words established. They had women in plural telling them, one group of women, or six of them telling the same thing. And then they had also the two on the road to Emmaus telling them hours later, same thing. And they didn't believe either one of them. So, by the way, you're not alone when you share God's word. They don't believe you. They don't believe someone else. It's not you or the, or the other person or me. It's just, it's, it's their disposition. It's where God has them. It's where God wants The same, yeah, transition from prophet to priest was hard, let alone from priest to king. It'll be even more difficult to accept that truth. Exactly. They're going to not long hear that either. And verse 14, afterwards he appeared to the eleven as they were reclining and censored their unbelief and obstinacy. When it says he, look at this verse 14, it's very, oh, it's very, it's, it's just, oh my gosh, it's so heart, heartbreaking to me. It says that he, that as they were reclining, that means when he, afterwards the eleven, that means that night when he came in the room and John, we're going to look to that a little bit later, it says that they were reclining they were just resting. And when he appeared, it says he reproached them. That means he gritted his teeth. It's this, um, it's, it's, it's this imagery where he goes, how could you not believe? There was an intimation in his voice that really was convicting to them because it says that he reproached them. He censored their unbelief in verse 14 of Mark 16, but it says their unbelief and their obstinacy. Look at the left side of your margin, what it means. It means hardness of their heart. They were so depressed, they were so sad, they were so upset, they, 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 were, they were blinded by the truth. Jesus told them a week before he died it was going to happen. Does this sound familiar to you and me? It sounds familiar to me a lot. When people cause you hardship and pain and anguish, when God himself is the one that you see who's in charge of all things as a sovereign God and you have pain and deep hurt and grief, you lose sight of anything else that matters and you get you feed into that hurt and that pain you feed into the anger you feed into the fear you feed into all those negative 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 evil wicked things that your sinful depravity is telling you yes god ordains it all but you keep feeding into that negative downward spiral of thoughts and what happens is your heart gets hardened what happens is jesus will appear to you and he will approach he'll, 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 he'll reprove you but he will do it with gritting his teeth when you grit your teeth, it, 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 it's, it's, it's intimating a sense of, of sternness. But Jesus, being a God of love and of peace, he does it with a gentle brick, like a velvet brick, I call it. So with a gentle sternness, he just kind of said, how could you not believe? And they were like, oh. Can you imagine the look on their faces when he's looking at them in a way of gritting his teeth, not to be ugly, but to be stern, a little bit more forceful, but, but kindness and love with peace. He did that gentle brick approach and it hit them hard because their hearts were hardened that night when he appeared to them. Remember, Resurrection Sunday, the men did not see him until after 6 p.m. tonight. None of the apostles saw him for who he was until after 6 p.m. tonight. And that's why, because Jesus wanted to teach them a lesson. You may have been the ones I spent the most amount of time with does not mean that everything works out the way you think it should. But people think, that's why he told them, remember, don't take the chief place. And he had the marriage feast. Always be humble. And if they were humbled and they were more accepting and more understanding that God moves in different ways, different people, they would have given the women more say, more sway of their thoughts. And like, wait, say again what you said? But they were just, they were upset about the different emotional states of mind. They were upset because how could they possibly have you be the one who saw them before us? All the different human things about what went into their thoughts about you, you're sounding like you're crazy. You keep talking fast and you're all emotional. You're delirious, sound euphoric. So that to be still and know he's God, right? These are lessons to be learned for us. So he goes into the, and, and verse 14 again, he goes, because they believe not those who had seen him after his resurrection, Mark 16, 14, Mark 16, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the glad tidings to the whole creation and to the world talking about the Jewish people here, the people of covenant. And it, that's what he's talking about. It says whole creation. It should, it should be to the people of covenant. That's what he's talking about. And then he says this. 
He who believes and is immersed will be saved. Look at the word for saved. It's in the plural tense. Look at the word for believed. It's in the plural tense. He who ongoing believes and is immersed will be ongoingly saved. I didn't write the book. The suffix in both words, believed and saved, is plural. I don't care what you think. Suck it up, buttercup. That's what Jesus said. Whether you like it or not, whether your pastor says it's wrong or not, is irrelevant. God said it. Boom. End of conversation. Hard stop. God's always right. Man's always a doofus. Full stop. God said, Jesus, who is God, said, ongoingly believe and be immersed. Not plural immersed. One time immersed. And you'll be ongoingly saved. That's interesting. Because when you first believe in Christ, you don't get baptized right away. The choice you make as a believer, dedicate your life to him. 16, Mark 16, 16. And then you're ongoingly saved because now when you first become a Mikros in Christ, you're a believer, saved from Hades. And then you, on your, on, you're working out that salvation with your sanctification. When you ongoingly work through the sanctification, reconciliation, you go to the technon stage when you typically get to be in the Baptist, if you be baptized state. That's when you're beyond the state of getting in fear of any negative recompense. That's what he means by saved ongoing. Because when you get baptized, you're committing yourself to live in a way that wants to serve and know God. And when you're doing that, you're in no fear of negative recompense. And that's why you're saved, plural. Saved in the blood of Christ, period. No one can ever take that from you. You'll never lose that salvation, ever. But the other salvation that he mentioned, not me, but in verse 16, Mark 16, the other is about negative recompense of chastisement of diso- for your disobedience of not being sanctified and reconciled to him which would never happen if your goal was to again to, to, to know and serve him you'll have your moments but you're on your striving to that point as you ongoingly believe to that point you'll be ongoingly saved that's his point yes immersed just once that's right he was immersed once those people teach you to be immersed many times it's crazy time so then he goes in here and he says and then look at look at also keep going and then not only will you be ongoingly believed, have been, have been immersed, and be ongoingly saved, but he, ha- but he having not ongoingly believed will be ongoingly condemned. That's in the plural. Hello, that ain't funny. Why is that in the plural? Because Hades isn't the end of it, by the way, my friend. There's Hades or Gehenna. There's like a fire. It's not funny. There's 2,000 years. It's a very sober issue here. He's giving them a really strong statement of like, they're like, what are you talking about? I mean, Imagine hearing this. It's insane. The night that they saw him for the first time, he drops a heavy, heavy truth bomb on them about doctrinal truth, about this moment in time, the way you're acting right now. just want you to know, it, it, you're going to correct yourself. So if you continue to act in this way, I'm going to tell you right now, there's some up and comings for you. And they're like, whoa, whoa. So first I've got to get past the fact that you're alive. Woo-hoo! Now you're telling me that if I don't continue on this path of continuing to believe of what this means, that I could have a retribution for that. He's like, that's right. That's right. You saw what it took me to get here, right? Well, guess what? You think I'm going to be okay with you believing it and then going, nah, I'm good. No, now nah, you're not good. No, you better believe and keep on remembering what it took me to get here. Because I demand it. So as the Father sends me, what do you say? So send I what? You. Hello. Hello. In this world, you have trial and tribulation and persecution. If they hated you, they hated me first. Buckle up, buttercup. It's a rough ride ahead. You can't get out of the raging rapids, but you can have Christ in the boat, steering the direction and keeping the boat calm. Verse 17, and, and he says, And these signs will accompany those, will accompany, in verse 17, these signs will accompany those who, having believed, that's past tense, in my name, they will expel demons. They will speak in new languages. They will take up serpents. And if they should drink any deadly poison, they should injure them. They will lay hands on the sick persons. They will be well. Then indeed, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down on the right hand of God. This was later on again as he is giving them this re- reprieve. This is, at, by the way, this is, this is later on. Again, with that Galilee. Remember, this is, I said they, they met that night with him. They didn't believe and later on, he appears to them in Galilee, and then he's given this charge to them. And those who do these signs and wonders, he tells you, oh, well, that's everybody. We shall be Pentecostal. No, no, no. That was because the word of God wasn't canonized yet, and they didn't know who was talking about God's word or not. And the apostles are being counterfeited. So to make sure you know who the true apostles are, who are the ones that really followed Christ, the 11, 
he gave you earmarks of what to look for. Then in verse 19, to make it clear, after he says he's taken away into heaven, that's his third ascension, and sat down at the right hand of God, verse 20 he tells you, and those having gone forth, proclaimed everywhere that the Lord cooperating and ratifying the word through the accompanying signs. That's what the signs and wonders were for, to ratify the word of God. Is it ratified now? Yes. Do I need to do this now? No. Stop lying. That was spoken to people that were following Christ, and those 11, and only those 11, were earmarked by those signs because God was understandably under no knowledgeable that these yahoos back in the day, like Simon the Sorcerer and Elimus in the book of Acts, other yahoos like that would try to act like, oh, I'm of, I'm of Christ, and do signs and wonders. Just like Dennis and Jambres tried to mock Moses for the power of Satan. Nothing new under the sun. He knew Satan was going to use other boneheads to act like, oh, I'm, I'm a follower of Christ. And they start doing his, and he goes, no, no, they have to do all, all these things. And just like Dennis and Jambres, what happens? They could only do a few, and they couldn't do them all, could they? <laughs> no. Just like we see today. Pentecostals. Look, 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 look. Okay, raise the dead. What's the matter? What's the matter? Hey, once you get a king cobra and bite him in your hand, see what happens. You're going to die. Stop lying. You know you're lying, right? Jesus made it very clear. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. I'm going to get off topic on that. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So in Mark 16, when he gets caught up, he gets caught up to your point when it says he, he, he was taken up. It says, uh, and then um, he was taken up into, into heaven. Uh, yeah, he was, his body was, again, typifying of glorified, spiritual, solical, and natural. So his first body you saw with, when he was with Mary was natural. And so to your point, I, I do believe this was the spiritual um, I think it was an order of each one. So it was a natural in the garden when he met Mary. It was a solical when he saw him in the road to Emmaus. It was a spiritual here when he left from Galilee in the book of Mark. Then it was the glorified body when he went up and he saw that, that, that the, the light and the white and they just went up out of their sight. Typified by them looking at the sun they couldn't see anymore, right? So I think I typified of that order. Natural, solical, spiritual, glorified. So yeah, that's what I think. I don't know that for certain, but that's what I think too, what you're saying. He changed. So, just like he did Mount Transfiguration. Was the road to Emmaus, and the spiritual was in Galilee when he left, and then the other one at the Mount of Olives was the glorified, which makes sense because that's when he comes back. He's going to be, you know, that's when he's pronounced as king. So when you get to, Mark, to Luke 24, Luke 24, verse 1, on the first day of the week, the early in the morning, uh, they went to the tomb, carrying their Aramaic, so they prepared, and they found the stone rolled away, having been rolled away from the tomb, and it says here, having entered. They went into, they found not. So they're inside the tomb again. And then you see, they found out not his body. In verse 4 of Luke 24, And it occurred as they were perplexed and in perplexity about this, Behold, two men stood by them in shining clothing. Two men. Same thing in clothing as you saw about the angel. It's just an outward garment. Whereas again, the young man is the only one with a stole, which is a long flowing robe, covers the feet. Which again speaks to a positional issue of his high, high up ranking, if you will, or intimacy with God. Because that's a different, like, bridal type garment imagery, all the way covering him. Whereas these two, Angel and Mark and Matthew 28, and these two men here in Luke 24, verse 4, they had an outer garment on. But it says here that, as then the, it says that they were in perplexity about this, beholding the two men. Again, they were an ongoing. So the word perplexity is in the dia, it means dia through. Their thoughts through what was going on were ongoingly just astounded. They were trying to ascertain the depth of God's word so just like you and me when we understand something new that God shows you in his word something new he shows you about himself through dia through that tr that understanding there's an ongoing perplexity you have to get your mind around it you have to shift everything you used to think get rid of the old wine skin put in the new one right that's a whole different frame of thought that's what's going on with them they're dazed they're confused they're confounded they're it's, it's a constant state of trying to readapt and readjust that's what Luke's talking about and 24 verse 4 these two men again the, the word for two men is just that it's not angels angelos it's just the word for uh, the for men for for men and nearest so in verse 5 of luke 24 and the women being afraid and bowing their faces to the earth 
these said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has been raised. Again, there's the Igiro again from the horizontal or vertical position. These are two men saying this. So first there was an angel, then a young man, now two men. And these two men, again, as they saw, they were inside the tomb when they went in verse 3, and they were inside. The angel was outside on the stone. The young man was sitting to the right. These men were standing inside. They're the first ones we noticed that were standing on the inside. So keep continue to watch this now. So as you continue to read this, remember how we spoke to you while he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered up into the hands of sinners and be crucified. And then third day he would rise again. There's your anastini, which means he'd be, he'd be risen again to stand again. He wouldn't just be a gear road from horizontal to vertical. He would actually stand again. He would walk again, in other words. So a gear road just speaks to being risen up from horizontal to vertical. Anastimi or anastii. Anastii just means that you're going to be able to walk again, stand again, right? So in verse 8, they recollected these words. Verse 9, and returning from the tomb. Now remember, Mark mentions the different women. So Matthew mentions Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mark mentioned Mary, the mother of uh, Mary Magdalene, and he mentions uh, Salome, interesting enough, and then Mary, the, the mother of James. Whereas Luke mentions Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and Johanna. So they both mention, they all, everybody mentions Mary Magdalene, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Mark and Luke kind of swap who they highlight. Mark highlights Salome, and then Luke highlights Joanna. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I was going to, thank you very much, thank you. The two men are, I didn't get that, sorry about that, thank you. They are testimony of that fact. So I think the angel is testimony of the one who, the, the one who first, the one who first blows the trumpet when things are going to be pronounced, of his pronouncement. The two men here, uh, the, the young man represents again the people in the bridal chamber, if you will, of the higher level that are, that are right there, reposed with him in intimate relationship. The two men represent, I believe, like you mentioned, the two witnesses, Elijah and Moses, and akin to those people who again will be standing with him in the airship or entrance of the heavens or airship of the earth and his coming messianic reign. Two different types of, of, of his kingdom. Kingdom of the heavens, kingdom of the God. Then, as you go into verse 9, which is what Moses and Elijah represented in, in their typology witnesses. Moses was on earth when he died. Elijah was caught up heavenly, earthly. Think about that, right? So, so when you look at verse 9, and returning from the tomb related all these things to the 11, or just again, the 11, and to all the rest. You see when it says all the rest? This is the first time in the scripture where Luke accounts for the fact that Matthew and Mark did not mention it, but Luke made, pays mention of it, that in time, the disciples themselves, the 11, not, didn't just know, secondly, after the six women knew, but then after that, the other 70 disciples knew, the other folks that were later on found in the upper room, they'd find out, Right? That's what they're talking about in Luke 24, 9. Who is the rest? That's the rest. People always say, who is the rest? Right? That's who the rest is. The 70 in Luke chapter 10 he called. The other ones who were making up the 120 people in the, in, the, in the Pentecost movement in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came upon them with power. The rest of those people. Joseph Arimathea, for example. Joseph Nicodemus. Pretty powerful people to, to be hearing this news. They were, they were the rare part of the rest. Right? Then he goes, and then he's part of those others. And people say, well, how would Joseph, Joseph Arimathea and Nicodemus find out? Who, what makes them? Because they were the ones who helped embalm him and put his body. Joseph Arimathea gave up his own tomb. Why wouldn't they be part of the rest? Why wouldn't they be? Why wouldn't the 70 disciples Jesus called in Luke 10 be part of the rest in Luke 24, 9? Why wouldn't they be? Of course they are. And by the way, it didn't just say the rest. It, it, it's written in the uh, left side of your margin. It's the poilois. It's those. In other words, he's pointing out those who had been basically appointed by him or following of him not these outlier believer people the unique ones the unique ones who are second tier to the 12 apostles which were now 11 would then be the 70 in Luke and then the other people outside the women would be people like Joseph Arimathea Nicodemus and others like them in verse 10 now there were Magdala Mary and Johanna remember Mary Magdalene's friend and that Mary the mother of James James the office the lesser and the others and the others we talked about who those were, again, Salome, Mary's sister Mary, and Mary the mother of Jesus, who told the things to the apostles. Verse 11, And these words appeared 
and there's that word ek in front of it again, that if out of their emotional journey they went through, they appeared, here you go, I've mentioned it now, Luke records it, they appealed to them like idle talk, and they believed them not. The word for idle is liros. We get our word leery. I'm leery of that, meaning I'm skeptical. That's the word here translated idle. It comes from the Greek word liros. It means I'm leery of that because you sound silly. You sound delirious. I I'm leery of that. I'm, le I'm, 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 I'm an ex-person for any conspiracy type thing. But you've got to corroborate the evidence and that's more convincing. Otherwise, I get leery of it. I'm very skeptical. Only thing I believe and trust fully is God and His Word. Other than that, you better start cooperating some stuff or else I got some concerns, right? But there's what they were saying. They were saying, look, I don't understand what you're saying. It sounds silly. It sounds like you're delirious. So, liros. Your words sound liros, idle to me. It sounds like they don't make any sense. I didn't believe you. Verse 12, Luke 24. But Peter arising. Peter, uh, he stood up. It, the word there, arising, is anastas. That means he, he, he didn't just go from hero to vertical. The reason why anastas is used, because he stood up and it was ongoing. It's in the plural. That means he stood up and he began to continue to walk. In other words, he was like going, okay, I gotta go, I'm tired of hearing all this. I'm going to go see for myself. Oh, he does all right. And so it says here, Peter rising, ran into the tomb. He ran. Stooping down. And by the stooping down means, stooping down means he, that he, you, have to, you have to bend down sideways. He was like this. It says sideways. That's the way the Greek language intimates what stooping down means. Why would someone, as the Shroud of Turin Catholic people want to tell me, it was a cloth line. Why go like this? Why? Why, why? why are you doing this number? Why would you do that? You know, why, you know why you would do that. If there's a hole from the neck down and there's a cast, a, a shell of a body cast from the neck down, hollow, I would make sense to me that you would go like this. Oh! There's no, it's a hollow shell. That makes sense. That's what he's doing. Not, oh, oh, look, oh there's, a, there's a cloth lying in there. No, doofus. He was looking inside the neck down at a shell. It was a plaster of Paris of his body. He was seeing no penetration. No unraveled, uh, unraveled uh, cloth. How in the blazes is it humanly, physically possible? It is impossible unless he's risen from the dead. You can't steal his body. You can't, you can't explain this any other way except for he's alive. There's no other way you can explain that. Because his body from the neck down was plaster of Paris, like a shell, like a mummification. And he stooped down, looked inside that shell, and went like, oh! <gasps> And then John talks about, we're going to get there in a minute, he saw the cloth where his face was wrapped, which was not plaster of Paris, folded up to the side. And that's why it says he stooped down. It means he looked in and he was tilted sideways. And that's why you would do that, to look inside something. Think about it. Come on, man. So he says here in verse 12, he, stood, he stooped down and saw the linen bands. He saw only the linen bands. And he went away by himself, wondering, wondering at what had happened. Again, See, each time somebody, understand this, each time, whether it was a woman or a man, whether it was those on the outlier women or the intimate men who were with them all the time, it didn't change the fact that when the power of God and the truth of God's word and the depth of what was really being understood to be, un, to be meant to be imputed to you, when you first come in contact with that, it's going to perplex you, make you tremble, make you afraid, confound you, cause you to have deep thought and rumination. Those are all natural reactions. But the response should ultimately be, I believe. The response should ultimately believe, do it unto me, Lord. Help me understand. So when you come across understanding of God in a deeper way or His Word, it's normal to be at first met with those emotions. But if you stay there and don't progress, that's where it's bad. Understandable is you start there, but you should not be where you stay. It should not be where you finish. You better continue on and believing, ongoing. You better continue on and, and walking by faith. So in verse 13 in, in, Mark, in Luke 24, And behold, two of them were going on the same day to a village called Emmaus, sixty furlongs from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other and about all the things which had happened. And it occurred while they were conversing and reasoning, Jesus himself, having approached, went with them. So he approached them. He comes up to them. He does not let them know who he is. You say, wait a minute, what about God's sovereignty? If it's not shown here, you must be blind. They cannot see him to save their life. They don't know who he is, even if they tried to and wanted to and understood everything. It didn't matter. It says here, look what it says in verse 16 of, of Luke 24. But their eyes were held, so they did not recognize him. You know what that means? That means placed under his grasp. 
Hello! They had no choice in the matter. They had no idea who he was because he made it sure they would not never know. Why? Why would God do that? Dominations teach today, oh, Christ is raised from the dead for the whole world to know. No, no, no. Under some people, he puts the grasp on their eyes to not see the truth. He puts deafness in their ears to not hear the truth. Didn't he say that? Though they have eyes, they will not see. Ears, they would not hear. He is the one who is now telling you that statement from Isaiah that he quotes to the apostles is intimated by his sovereign hand causing that to be. We think that we can will ourselves to see or will ourselves to hear. No, you cannot. God has to give you the eyes to see and the ears to hear or else you'll be blind and deaf your whole life. And if you do become, you have eyes to see who God is and ears to hear his word, it doesn't mean you get to see all of his depth of his truth, all of who he is. No, it does not. It does not mean you get to hear everything you want to hear and you're blessed. Beyond. No, it does not. God still, secondly, has to, as you already believe in him, as he gave you that as a gift, he gives you another gift if he sees fit to unveil more of his understanding to you of who he is in his word. He tells you that right here in the book, in the book of Luke chapter 24, 16. The principle is clear. Did he not grasp their eyes to blind them from who he was walking right next to him? Yes. Did they not know already that he was from the dead? Yes. So that means believers in Christ who saw risen the dead were actually blinded from the truth by God himself. Think about that, what that means. That God will only give you what you need to hear, when you need to hear it, and it's based on his sovereign will for your life. You've got to accept that. Accept it. Stop fighting and getting angry at other people. Like the disciples getting angry at the women. No, 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 no. Don't get indifferent with each other. If you want to blame somebody, blame God. I don't suggest doing that. <laughs> but point your finger upwards to God and go, why? I don't, help me understand why. Help me. But these people, verse 17... As he said to them, what words are these that you are exchanging with each other as you walk and as you are, why are you dejected? They were downcast. And the one named Cleopas, because his wife is another Mary, at the cross she was, answering to him, art thou only surgeoner in Jerusalem? They asked him, who was unacquainted with the things which have occurred in these days? In other words, what are you, what are you, are you born yesterday? I mean, how did you not know what happened back on Wednesday? I mean, it was a, I mean just a few days ago. It was a traumatically demonstrative, ridiculous example of hate among the Romans, among the Jewish leadership. We ourselves, we, we couldn't stand up for him, and it, it just overwhelmed us. We started with Hosanna, wonderful prophecy conference, led to a state of just hatefulness, betrayal, and then just traumatic murder. And then and what he said and what he did was just always loving on us through the whole thing. What we had to see and visualize would never leave our minds forever. And then we thought he was dead. And now he's alive. You ever heard about any of that? Really? Jesus is like, yeah, it's about me. <laughs> they don't know who he is. Of course he knows. It's him. But they're going, yeah, you don't know what happened. You, you don't know. Well, let me tell you what happened. So in verse 19, when he said to them, what things? What things? Really? You see, was Jesus lying? No. He is just wanting them to reveal themselves, to the, but to reveal to themselves like he did with Abraham what he already knew to be true. With Abraham, he already knew he was going to sacrifice his son. Abraham didn't know that. God did that test to reveal out of Abraham to himself how much he loved God. He wanted them to know what they didn't understand by repeating what he already had given them. Understand that. So when God says ruminate or meditate on the glory of God, he means that sometimes when you don't understand what God's given you present tense, it's because you have to go back on what God's already given you and meditate and ruminate and appreciate what he's already done for you, what he's already given you, and then all of a sudden the light bulb will go off as to what the present thing you don't understand he's doing. Then you're like, oh, it makes sense now. That's what he's doing. He's not saying, oh, what happened? Of course he knows what happened. He wants them to recall it and restate it so that they can hear themselves and maybe that spiritual light bulb will then go off and they'll start to understand how they should be really thinking really where their heart should be their mind should be where their spirit should be it was in the wrong place they were emotionally driven at this point it's getting them away from their emotion and into the scriptural fulfillment of their of their spirit so okay to react like that at first 
But now it's time to respond in the way that God wants you to, the way God expects you to as a believer. That's what he was doing. And they said to him, the things concerning Jesus, the Nazarene, a Nazarite, a man who was a prophet, a powerful in the work, and the word before God and all the people. In verse 20 of, Matthew, of Luke 24, and how the high priest and our rulers delivered him up to the sanhe- to sentence of death and crucified him. Notice how, again, they clearly ended the bait. It wasn't the Romans who killed him. People of the day knew clearly who killed him. It was Sanhedrin. They wanted him dead. So all these people wanted to bait. Well, oh, the Romans killed him. No, no, they carried out what the Jewish people wanted to do, which was kill him. Let's face that fact right now. Stop lying to yourself, okay? Even they knew it back in the day, okay? Verse 20, and now the high priest and our, and our rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. Verse 21, but we hope that, he was, that it was he who was about to redeem. Ongoing, by the way, look at the tense, AI, long, ongoing, redeem Israel. Not just be a king now over them and subdue the Romans and the Sanhedrin and reject them, but to ongoingly manifest his messianic reign. They wanted redemption from both the man of the government of Romans and of the Sanhedrin's rule over them, but they also wanted the ongoing redemption of having Christ be the Messiah, establish his kingdom. They wanted two things, freedom from the evils of men and freedom under the rule of God. That's what they wanted. That's why it's in the plural. They don't understand about what God means by plural lutrosis, meaning in the heavenly. They don't understand that. <laughs> but here you have in verse, I didn't write the book, it's in the plural, verse 21 of Luke 24, left side of your margin. And besides all this, this day is the third since these things were done. But some of our women also astonished for us, also astonished us for having been at the tomb. That means that we were flabbergasted. We just out of our minds, out of what they were telling us, we were more were like, what? And in verse 23, they didn't find his body. They came saying that, that they had seen a vision of angels. A vision of angels, plural. They had seen ongoing. That's what it says in the Greek, left side of Mark. Ongoingly seen. Out of the experience, they saw multiple, they did see multiple things. But notice how the, they're retorting it as it was a vision. It wasn't a vision. It happened. They didn't say it was a vision. You're saying that. He wants them to hear what they're saying. This is why you're not believing it, because you're not believing what they said. You're not believing it was actually true. You're actually trying to explain away how it can't be true, how they might be just delirious and just weary and emotionally and mentally willing to see something that they wanted to see because they missed me so much because they're grieving so much. He said he was alive. Verse 24, and some of those with us went to the tomb and found that it was, it was as the woman said. But him they saw not. Verse 25, and he said to them, O oh, inconsiderate men, First thing he says to them after asking them, what happened? And they tell him. And he says to them in verse 25 of Luke 24, uh, inconsiderate man. It means you have no thought and no reasoning. So how? So our Pentecostal and other charismatic friends want to say, God doesn't want to have your brain. He wants your emotions and your spirit of worship. Well, excuse me. Jesus, at the most euphoric time in history, his resurrection said put some thought into it and put some reason into it that's what his charge was not my words his not my word not this moron jesus said oh inconsiderate men where is your thoughts where is your reasoning he appealed to what he had already taught them and what they already had heard and seen in christ and that the women testified of that truth that's what he's bringing out i didn't just teach you didn't just hear it you saw me live out who i was you heard them testify that what they said was true, that I rose from the dead, and you still are wondering if it's true. Have you not? Where is your thinking and reasoning? Put together the two things, what was and what is. And he even said to them, slow of heart to believe. All which the prophets have spoken. You see? Because your emotion and your state of mind currently puts you in a position where you lose sight of what was taught You lose sight of what is true because your emotions and your present state of mind consumes you. In verse 26, was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter his glory? He asked them. Verse 27, and beginning from Moses and through all the prophets, he explained them and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, by the way, this time of day is sometime uh, of the morning time. And they later on say it became evening. So this journey took a couple hours. And could you imagine... Could you imagine being Cleopas and his wife on the way to Emmaus, and here's Jesus. This is, by the way, this is by the most awesome time ever 
without being one of the women or being one of the apostles, if I had a choice to be somebody during the resurrection, I want to be one of these two people right here. I want to be Cleopas. Because you have Christ himself as the master teacher walking you through all the fulfillment of Moses and the law and the prophets, that, that, the Psalms and the prophets. That's amazing. That is awesome. He's, you imagine him walking you through like J. Vernon McGee walked through the Bible. <laughs> this, is not, this makes that look like nothing. This is Jesus Christ, Yeshua, God, God, the great I am, walking you through the Bible. Walking you through. Let's go Genesis. We start walking through the Bible. Everything that testifies of him. Everything that was written about, about him and about the writings of Moses and the Psalms and the prophets. Could you imagine that time with him? I couldn't imagine what he was saying, what they were, their facial expressions. Well, what's he doing though? You see, this is what, I, what's he doing? He's building scale of depth, of framework to remind them how they should receive the present reality. This is the same thing that we're supposed to understand when it comes to God's deeper truth that people have a hard time receiving. You can't just keep forcing it and forcing it and forcing it. You gotta step back and go back to the beginning and re reset the framework. Restate the framework of truth of God's word because that's the problem. The disposition of your mind, the reference to your framework of what you think this means or that is, that's where the error lies. Let's go back to that. Let's reset the framework. Let's reset the mindset. Let's reset everything based on God and his truth. And then progressively, as he went forward with that mindset, their eyes were opened. And then he says, ha, 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 ha. Remember that? They started to break bread. And it says in verse 28, or verse 27, all the scriptures and all these things concerning himself, he explained them. That means he just out of, he just continued to expound it on them. It's unbelievable. I wish I could have been there. Verse 28, Matthew, Luke 24, and they drew near the village where they were going, which is Emmaus, and he seemed as intending to go further. In other words, he was looking like he was going to go further. And all of a sudden, verse 29, they urged him, saying, Remain with us, for it was towards evening. I mean, at, it was getting towards 6 o'clock at night. And the day has already declined, and he was, in, uh, he was to abide with them. He went in to abide with them. Verse 30, And it occurred as he reclined with them, taking the, the loaf, he blessed God, and having broken it, he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he disappeared from them. <laughs> so he went like he broke a loaf and they were like oh and they saw the hole right there they're like he's da, 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 da. yeah yeah it's like that but why didn't you show him that to begin with do you see what god wants one you me us me you us he wants us to first before we know the truth of the deep joys of god he wants us to first re reconnect with what he's already done what he's already given us re re understand re reevaluate and meditate on what god has been in our life what he's already given in our life, and really realize what's of man, what's of God, hold tightly to that of God, ruminate over what he meant, what he said, why he did it, all that stuff, right? Put it together. And if we're still slow of understanding and reason, what does God then do? God walks us back from the beginning and resets our template of how we see him, resets our framework, how we understand the word of God. And then he builds and he builds and he builds. And he's restructuring and reformatting our brain cells. It's like he's reformatting us, like our computer motherboard. He's reformatting our mind, redoubling a new operating system of truth, not from human errors or traditions. He's re resetting it. And then he goes, now you're ready for the truth to be revealed. That's you're on the cusp of understanding, but you really were able to put it. Now you're ready. And he goes, break. And they go, oh! And they knew it right there. And he's like, if I was them, I'd say, why did you wait till now? He goes, because you know why. Search your heart. You'll know why. I had to bring it to this journey to get to this moment. Yes. Oh, yeah, to be exactly right. People are all slow of heart to believe in Revelation what's going to happen. They don't believe it. They always call it Revelations too, by the way. I hate that. They put an S on it. Ugh. It's just one singular revelation of Jesus Christ, right? But people are slow of heart to believe the future is going to happen, the tribulation, the coming of Revelation events. They don't believe it because they think it's, it's been around for so long. How does it happen yet? It's all folklore. But that's the thing that they were going through in this time. So he says to them that we breaks the loaf and they gave it to him and they knew who he was. In verse 31, their eyes were open. And they knew him. As soon as they knew him, he disappears. <laughs> what? Shouldn't that be a time when you now deal, drill deep into what you just, nope, he gone. The purpose of him doing that was to get you to that point. And now his purpose, it's like there's, a, there's an old adage in, in, in uh, there's an old Disney movie I like because the, the, the phrasing reminds me of something that Jesus would say. There's the whole Nanny McPhee. He'd say, she said, when you, when, you need, when you want me, you won't need me. And when you need me, you no longer want me. It's like, what? You see? It's such an interesting statement. Like, when you need Jesus, you won't want him. But then when you want him, you no longer need him at that point to be your personal tutor. The word's enough. And that's the thing with people today in our K-12 
charismatic, error-driven teaching world. They want Jesus, but they don't realize that he's right here in the scripture, living word. They don't understand he's right here. Then he has to show them he's always been here with us and the truth of this word to help us come alive with the truth of who he is. And then when we see it, we still want more of him. He goes, you don't need me now. That's the whole point was to lead you to this. Go, gosh, almighty, stop looking at sensationalism and go back to the scripture. That's the truth. That's the truth. He is the truth. It testifies of him, this book. Yes. Uh, not yet. That comes later on in verse 51. You probably got jumped the gun a little bit. He does have an ascension in Luke 24, but it's later on in 51 where it clearly says that he, 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 he was carried up. But no, not here. It's a prelude to it, but it's not. He just disappeared. He just left him. So, but no, not, not yet. So verse 32, and he said to each other, did, did our hearts burn while he talked with us on the road and while he unfolded the scriptures to us? See, this is where the Mormons say, read it until your heart burns within you. N no, dude that's different you're trying to use a human reference to bastardize what god was saying to these people was truth 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 using truth 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 and then from that truth from from the truth who taught it using the truth to validate it they were saying doesn't that burn our hearts that's not what the mormons and other people would want to say about the same phrasing they're talking about your own emotions you know people say i prayed about it and so i did it because i have peace with it and your scripture reference is no 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 i feel good about it i, I understand that based on what story or scripture verse do you feel good about what you're about to do that you say God directs you to do? And what they do is they, oh, my heart burned. I, I don't care what you felt. It's probably a heartburn, my friend. What did you feel in your heart should be validated by the truth of the word of God or stop using that phrase. It is moronic and dumb. We do it all the time. Oh, I, my heart burns and that's how I know it's true. Uh -uh. That's your emotions and your mental state of lies lies i tell you lies their hearts burn because the truth god told them the truth the word of god and that's what burned in their hearts the truth my friend like a seared no wonder burned in their heart no kidding it's the truth teaching the truth <laughs> no wonder burned in their hearts duh had nothing to do with their emotions and their state of mind and their intellectual no moron had to do with them hearing from the teacher of all teachers teach from the book of all books that's why it burned in their hearts so let's use that phrasing correctly, please. I hate it, folks, use things incorrectly, and it bastardizes and minimizes the, 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 the awesomeness of who God is and his word. Verse 33, 